Welcome back to another episode of A Mental Health Break with Vincent A. Lancey. I'm excited to launch another episode for you all. I'm Vincent Lancey, speaker and author of the book, Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption. When I was 21 years old, I was the victim of a hit and run accident while walking home from a friend's birthday. After coming out of a coma and suffering from a traumatic brain injury, or you may know of as a TBI, I soon realized that it was time to put my mental health on a very high pedestal. This transformative experience has led me to create a podcast that is all things mental health. Would it benefit you to hear from mental health professionals and influencers? Would it also add value to your life to hear real life and authentic stories from people talking about their mental health, the issues they face, and how they actively combat them? If you answered yes to any of those questions, you came to the right place. I want to start by congratulating you for making your mental health a priority. If you missed the last episode, be sure to download it after you tune in today. On this episode, I am happy to introduce my guest, Stacia Alexander. I met Stacia through networking as a guest on my other podcast, What It's Really Like to Be an Entrepreneur, said they would have a great fit for my mental health podcast, so I had to learn more. Dr. Stacia Alexander has been making major moves in the mental health world over the last 20 years and is also a mental health director. I could go on with this intro for a little bit, but Stacia, thanks for coming on my show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Stacia, would you mind please introducing yourself to our listeners and share who you are to them before we get dive in and get going? And please share your role relating to mental health. Of course, of course. So I'm Dr. Stacia Alexander. I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. I have been a licensed professional counselor for over 20 years now. And I've been in private practice for just that amount of time. So in managing a group practice, part of my responsibility, I deem, is a mental health advocate, operating as a mental health advocate. So I do quite a bit of outreach to talk to people uh, in order to remove the stigma of mental health, to make it more accessible and to make it uh, more reasonable for people. Like, this is something that I really need to incorporate into my life. So as well as operating that, practice, I'm also the clinic director of a local HBCU called Paul Quinn College in Dallas. We have a student body of about 550 students, and the primary goal there in the clinic is to make sure that they understand how much of an impact taking care of their mental health will have on their overall college success. So thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. I love the intro, and I love how you're doing the right thing, trying to make sure people can get the care they need which is part of this platform is one of my many goals of this to, like you said, break down stigmas and give people a voice to share these opinions. So thank you coming on with all this expertise. I'm very excited for you to share. But on each episode, what I do is I share a mental health story of someone who is famous because I want to let you, the listeners, know that you are not alone. I want you to understand that even though someone looks like they are healthy from the outside, they may not be on the inside too. I will now introduce the mental health-related story of Jennifer Lawrence that I read on Bipolar Digest. For you that don't know Jennifer Lawrence, she's one of the stars of the uh, the Hunger Games franchise, and she's begun to talk about her struggle with social anxiety. At the time she spoke out publicly, she courageously stood as one of the few celebrities with anxiety who was open and honest about her condition, how it affected her, and what she's been doing to combat this anxiety. And according to Women's Health in 2017, she said her anxiety peaks on airplanes. She said it's, she's not scared of the airplane itself, but rather her on the airplane. One of a few separate occasions, she even started to have panic attacks on the flight, in the middle of the flight, and she actually once yelled out to the passengers that the plane was going to crash. She even tried to jump out of an Air France jet. The article continued where she talked with the Huffington Post in 2013 and shared how anxiety was something that she grew up with. And I thought this was an important detail to share because of how many it can resonate with in growing up with anxiety. But to finish it up, she said at times she often feared falling short academically, but also afraid to be around others. And she was described as having this bubbly personality was the quote in the article. And that suddenly disappeared because of this fear. She said it's still an ongoing issue to date, but it's something she's both found to deal with and demonstrated ways to deal with. Stacia, what do you take away from her story and her public statements with mental health? I think it's a realization that people deal with anxiety far more than we think. 
And it's also one of those uh, conditions that are underdiagnosed because over time you learn to live with the symptoms that you're having. So I think it's awesome that she spoke out about this. And I think it is a good story that we can share, especially with millennials, because they don't tend to stop and listen to their body and actually see how they're reacting to a situation. I would like to hear more about what she did to actually deal with the anxiety and that helps her manage those emotions that she's having, especially when she's preparing for, you know, like she's in entertainment or preparing to go on flight. Like what tools has she used that help that has helped her? Yeah, I think it's very interesting because it's a career that's heavily reliant on traveling and the airplane. So mm -hmm. I, I thought it, it jumped out at me and I thought, hey, this might be a good one to include on the show mm -hmm. because it's definitely a common fear. You, you know, something with planes. I know that's not the first time I've heard a fear like that. And plus the social anxiety now with the cell phones, there's a whole mm -hmm. science probably developing with that. So thank you for all of your insights, Stacey. That was great. And now mm -hmm. it's time for the main event. On each episode, my guest and I will go over this series of six questions, which only slightly varies depending on if the guest is speaking on their own or others' mental health. You ready to go? I'm ready. Great. So many would agree that the more common or talked about types of mental illnesses are mood disorders, anxiety disorders, or schizophrenia disorders. What areas do you come across the most? The mood disorders, adjustment disorders, are in probably, well, okay, so I have to answer that in two phases. Please in my do. private practice, more of adjustment disorder, mood disorders, because people are having a, um, more difficulty dealing with the, the life events. And so they come in to talk to me when those life events become overwhelming. In the college setting, we are actually learning that more college students have a history of trauma or some type of crisis that was unresolved than we would like to believe. And it is different from yesteryears when we could just keep going in spite of those difficulties. We're finding that they become more handicapping now because there are so many triggering events that happen that are outside of our control. When you get on a college campus, ideally you should be kind of contained, but with everything being as open as it is with social media, there could be a trigger that no one would have ever considered just because you were scrolling on Instagram or something. 100% right. So that information overload, it's come up before people are just going on their phone and you could be having a nice calm day, but all of a sudden you're exposed to millions and million pieces of information. Yeah in seconds and i also like what you said about kind of musking the pain in the past that's come up on some of my celebrity interviews in the beginning we did kevin love and it said you know his dad always said suppress those feelings you know mm -hmm. be a man and now mm -hmm. we're learning all the negative effects that that actually causes right right it, it has its way of showing its face whether you deal with it or not, it, it stays in your body. And at some point it's going to come out either through your relationships, how you manage your uh, crisis situations or the anxiety that this mis, uh, entertainer, Miss Lawrence was experiencing. It's going to manifest in some way. Yeah. I think it's important to get out ahead of it. And I know something mm -hmm. for me, how valuable therapy has been, especially when you find that right person to talk to. Mm -hmm. I, I just think with all the information out there, you're doing a disservice to yourself if you're just bottling all that in. Right. There's so much, and the plethora of information, even on the internet, you know, you can find anything. You can, and this is what I caution people, like I even do a course on the ethical responsibility of therapy uh, and exposing people to educational resources because they're exposed to so much through the memes, the articles, the videos, and people are taking therapy lightly and they're going to people who really aren't licensed clinicians. And so they may think that they're getting counseling, but it's not therapeutically sound. It's not, excuse me, theoretically sound uh, counseling services. And so I caution people, make sure you're working with a licensed clinician. Make sure you're working with someone who has ethics training. Make sure you're working with someone who understands the dynamics of therapy and they're not just like you said, telling you, hey, this is how, just muster it up, get through it, work on your goals. Even I talk about goals, but at some point I look at people and say, wait a minute, wait, 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 we can't get anywhere because there's this emotional undertone that, is, that you're struggling with and we need to deal with that. Yeah, it's very true. You need to get your information from the right source no matter what area it may be. Because everybody is, you know, a professional and has opinions, mm -hmm. which is which is fine. But you need to be careful who you're <laughs> listening to because you may be doing yourself a disservice. Right. 
<laughs> Stacia, when did you first decide that a career relating to mental health was going to be the right career for you? Can you paint that picture for our audience? It's a very clear picture in my head, a story that I enjoy telling. Great. Uh, great. Six or seven, it was seventh grade. When I was uh, arguing with my mom, we had a pretty difficult go at it for a while. My parents had divorced, and so I was sitting in the living room after an argument with her. There were some books on the shelf that my dad left. He, he had his college books that were still on the shelf, and I saw a psychology book, and I just started looking through it saying, you know, maybe I can figure out what's wrong with us, and I came up on this word, dysfunctional. And that's when I realized neither one of us was a hateful person. Neither one of us was mean. I had been called selfish for quite a while. That We weren't actually that, but indeed we were dysfunctional. That my family was dysfunctional. And from that summer, that seventh grade year, up until high school, I read the entirety of that college book with an intent to help my family and grew into a love for the field of psychology. Wow, that's an incredible story. What, uh, so <laughs> What takeaways you still have from that first book? Do you have any still things that stick out in your head? Because that was a well, pretty that one word. Book. It was dysfunction. That one word, dysfunctional. Because I mean, I mean, we were so. I had basically embraced the image that my family had of me, that my teachers had of me. She's mean. She's a bully. She's hateful. But I was hecka smart. That's not to brag. So I never got kicked out of school at that age. It was just an issue of, um, okay, she's getting her grades, but behaviorally, we can't do anything with her. Like, if I decided that I didn't want to obey that day, I just was not going to obey. But once I started reading about being dysfunctional, I realized that I had the capacity to choose, that I could learn another way to behave and conduct myself, even though I was angry about what was going on with my family. So it, even though, you know, like I'm reading that book in seventh grade, and I got to high school, I was still cantankerous and having all these problems. It didn't really sink in until my first freshman year in high school that I decided I am going to create another life separate in terms of the dynamics, how I get along with people, how I talk to people, how I conduct myself, that I'm not going to be that same angry person going into my adult life. So it, it was a true uh, transformational experience to find that book. Um, and it took a lot of work to deal with the things that I was learning on a professional level. I had to do my own work in therapy, but yeah, it, it was, that was it for me. I love it. Well, I think since we're on that topic, I'll have to ask that you do have a good, and you have a good information sound on it. So someone comes across and you find them to be things, maybe in that dysfunctional category. What's the first thing you're telling them? What's the first recommendation? Are you at peace? That's, that's how I start working with my clients. Whatever you're doing that's robbing you of your peace, let's get in there and deal with that. Let's stop ignoring the things that are creating this negative space for you. So if it's your response to people, it's your, if it's your interactions, it's the choices you're making, let's deal with those things that are robbing you of your peace. And then I backdoor the theoretical perspectives on how we're going to actually resolve those difficulties that the person is having. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know the value that's going to give to our listeners, but let's segue over to what advice can you give to our listeners? What may be considered a potential early sign that they may be starting to develop some kind of mental health illness or complication? So it's like, like, let's go back to anxiety. The reason I really encourage people to deal with anxiety because anxiety tells you constantly that you're not good enough. That's what anxiety does for us. And if you wake up every day thinking that you're not good enough, then that's going to roll over into other mental health episodes that you're not prepared to deal with either, which is uh, depression, which creates the suicidal thinking, uh, the uh, psychosis because you're not getting enough sleep, the anxiety is bothering you. So with the uh, mental health issues, if things begin coming up, you're not sleeping regularly. Your diet has changed, your routine has changed, and your level of negativity is so high that even your friends are telling you, you just need to chill out. Like, it's just not that bad. But in your mind, when you step back, it's really that bad. So everybody else can't be wrong. And I think that's one of the hardest things for people who are struggling with their mental health to accept is that what is it about me? that I can't see what everybody else is seeing. And so I also educate people. Um, like I have asthma. Okay. So if I get out to go running and I have asthma without my albuterol, I'm going to pass out. Like I've fainted several times, I get it, not afraid of it anymore. 
So I would never talk myself into going to run without alcohol. So I do that with psychotropic medications as well. There's something chemically about the way that you are designed that if you try to go through day-to-day activities without that medication, you're going to (laughs) faint. Like you're just going to fall short. And even though you may be used to it, it's not the best thing for you and it's not the safest thing for you. So let's get in there and figure out what's going on with you. Is it chemically? Is it situationally? Are there some things that we can work through? Talk therapy? Are there some things that we need to get some medication to address? So you're saying just break it down at first and just dissect it, see what's going on. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it does come up a lot where it may just be right in front of the whole time where are you sleeping right? You know, are you eating? Yeah. And, you know, that's that's a great, great perspective. But say someone is finding themselves having a bit of a mental illness. And I say only mm-hmm. three here because I want the three most important things here, Stacia. If you could pick three and only three, what would the three best things for our listeners can do on a daily basis to start improving their mental health? They can get enough rest. They can eat correctly. And they can get activity in, exercising, getting those endorphins going. Those three things, I can elaborate, but those are the top three things that I always eliminate when people come in. How are you sleeping? What foods are you eating? And are you active? Yeah, so let's let's break each of those down for our short-term base here. Sleep. You're not saying just sleep one or two hours. You're not saying eat a bag of chips. What are we saying here? So with your sleep-wake routine, there's such thing called a circadian clock, which a lot of people don't pay attention to. That circadian clock actually contributes to our overall emotional wellness. If we do not get the adequate amount of sleep to rejuvenate and to uh, uh, heal overnight the things that we have damaged during the day, we're operating at a deficit the day after. If you continue operating at a deficit, that is going to take a toll on you mentally. We think that we're just tired. We think we're physically tired, but our brains are also tired. And so they're kind of like, they have a sludge. It's not really running properly. And then when you look at our nutrition, there's a reason that we have these nutritional plans that have been around for generations. There's a reason that our bodies do better when we eat leafy green vegetables and fruits and protein, but we're inundated with processed food. Our bodies were not designed to metabolize processed foods and operate at their full capacity. So if you live out the life of junk food, it may work when you're younger, but the older your body gets, it's harder to metabolize that and to use that source as a proper fuel source for your brain. And the other thing is activity. Get moving, get moving, get moving. That releases the serotonin love, uh, serotonin hormones in your brain. It helps you to feel better. We're talking about the chemical physiology aspect of mental health care at this point. Yeah, I really enjoyed how you did a little bit of each there because you gave us the many separate parts of mental health. People mm-hmm. that aren't as educated with the mental health world, maybe categorizes one thing, I have a healthy mental but there's so many components that you can help yourself. You know, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not, not helping yourself out. But those are great short-term initiatives, Stacia. Let's look a little deeper, a little longer. What are two long-term commitments our listeners can start to make to create a more healthy mindset? So especially if those things aren't working, they can definitely look at some counseling options, some therapeutic options, and creating a relationship with someone who will hold them to a certain level of accountability as it relates to their life routine. So when people tell me, when I have my girlfriend or I talk to my pastor or my grandmother's always, right, but they love you so much. They love you so much. And they won't take an objective perspective on your life. So if you're coming to counseling, that counselor may say, you know what? You've kind of come in here looking pretty raggedy. I'm pretty upfront with my clients. You've been looking a little raggedy for the last three weeks that you've come in. What's going on? Whereas that person around you may adjust to that a day-to-day uh, you know, exposure, they will adjust to that. So definitely incorporating counseling into the routine. You don't even have to go every week, but just having someone that you can check into. I'm a firm believer in having a counselor, just like you do your primary care physician, your optometrist, your dentist, and some of us even have a stylist that we go to regularly. So why wouldn't you have a uh, therapist on deck, just like you do your other providers who contribute to your quality of life. So that's the first thing, the counseling. And the second thing is setting goals. Definitely have goals because that helps you to understand whether or not you're on track. That's going to enhance your accountability overall in your life. If you're just out here floating around, 
you don't know if you're doing better or not. <laughs> and you could be doing better, but because you're having um, an episode, if you will, the world just seems dark and dreary and you can't get anything right. When reality, you probably elevated over the last six months more than you actually realized. I love how kind of the central theme that's developed here is accountability, whether it's from you or somebody else. It's all stems from just holding yourself accountable and doing the little things to make it happen. Very, I, yes. like, how you, I like how you're doing that. Thank but, you. But you have a great, great track record in the mental health world. You've been around a lot of places. You've been giving back tremendously. What are some ways you plan on raising awareness for the mental health in the future? What are some things we're working on in Seattle, Stacia? So uh, we had to postpone our annual event. It's called the State of Mental Health in Black Women. Uh, we do that to make sure that we're uh, providing information to people about uh, mental health services, what's available, new techniques. We want to make sure that under women understand how much of a contributor it is to their overall lives and right. wellness. So I do those kind of talks. I do, um, I work with other people to collaborate on symposiums in the community and in the educational sector. We're uh, writing a book, Private Practice, because I coach people to launch their private practice. There's a huge need for private practice, and there's a huge need for diversity in private practice. Not everybody wants to go to a community center. So working feverishly on that. And the last thing that I do is a monthly show called uh, Goals Don't Have Feelings with Dr. Stacia Alexander. And that, that show is similar to yours is that I talk to professionals and entrepreneurs about the emotionality of success. Everyone talks about be, building a business plan, getting your website ready, marketing, your financial, your legal things, but nobody really talks about the emotionality of success. Like when I left for college and went off and was doing these things, my parents never called me and said, how you doing, baby girl? You in college. Nobody ever said that. They were just like, woo, that girl is gone. Let her do what she Oh, no. Yeah. But that was a different life for me to be in on a college campus and really making it for myself. So on an entrepreneurial level and a professional level, I talk to people about their journey of success. How long have you been involved with the personal life coach? Doing all um, so the, oh, the private practice life coaching? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's been in my private practice because I'm an LPC supervisor. So I've been doing that for over five or six years. That's, now yeah, it's all I privatized. Good for you. Clinicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Stacia, thank you so much for coming on today. I know our listeners see all the value in your episode today. Some things I really enjoyed, and I find this a lot of things, the passion. You found a passion super young. You grabbed that book, <laughs> and, and it stuck with you. And it helped mold your success and the way you're carrying your business. I think that's great. I uh -huh. love how you broke down everything simple and saying if these things don't work, it's okay. There are more options. There are therapy. And how you, you say, hey, think twice. You have a dentist. You have a stylist. Why don't you have someone taking care of your brain? I think that's yeah. awesome. So thank you so much. <laughs> Why Stacey. is your hair more important than your mental health? <laughs> right, right. And that's, and that's a problem that we're all working together to break down as the word mental health will lose that stigma, hopefully, eventually. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. time for the last word here, Stacia. I do this on my other podcast, what it's really like to be an entrepreneur too, because I want our listeners to really get to know my guests. Is there something that you want to share with the listeners that we did not get to touch on today? I just want to share with the listeners to be supportive of one another. If we take anything from this time to kind of regroup is that everybody has a need to be loved on, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, and to stop being so hard on one another. That we really do uh, elevate each other when we send out those positive vibes and energy uh, affirmations, if we could do that with one another, because you never know where somebody is mentally, emotionally, and cognitively what's going on with them. So if anything, I want people just to just say, take a step back and really be encouraging. Absolutely. Well, please list the ways for listeners to get encouraged by you, that whether that's social media, website, or what are your professional handles for everybody to follow your journey? So my website is www.staciaalexander.com. So that's S-T-A-C-I-A. -A. Everything is listed on there. You can find me on most social media platforms at Dr. Stacia Alexander, just D-R. And my Twitter handle, but it's not very active, <laughs> is Stacia underscore P-I. So I'm on LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel, Instagram, and the website, Facebook, of course, you can find me. Absolutely. Everybody be sure to check out Stacy's material to stay motivated and learn great, great tips to stay positive mentally. And be sure to check out the show on Instagram and Facebook at a mental health break. 
and we're on Twitter at Podcasts by Lancey. I'm at Vincent A. Lancey on all social media and YouTube, and my website is vincentalancey.com. Be sure to check out my book, Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption, on Amazon now, but DM me or email me. I want to hear what you think. If you liked today's episode, please continue listening and rate A Mental Health Break with Vincent A. Lancey five stars. I work hard to find value delivering stories for you on each episode. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode of A Mental Health Break with Vincent A. Lancey.